Good this morning. Come on, give it up. All right, I'm about to change that. No, I'm just teasing. I'm the feel good. I'm just going to hug you today and make you feel special. But we are in a series called Spiritual Warfare. That just makes you all feel all warm and fuzzy, right? Spiritual Warfare. We started out in Ephesians and uh, proclaiming with Paul that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Amen? That means it's not against that irritating boss. It's not against that never happy spouse. It's not against that knucklehead neighbor or even that wingnut politician. No, it's not. It's not, it's not, it's not. It's against spiritual entities that wage war against our and your soul. Those spiritual dark entities that drive you away from God's joy in Jesus Christ, distract you from God's purpose in your life and turn you into a vessel of anger, irritation, hopelessness, and depression. The war is on, people. What a way to start a sermon. I mean, where, where's the story and the joke? Listen, we don't have time this morning, man. we got to get on with what God wants to deal with this morning. So we talked about an unseen realm where this battlefield takes place. We showed you the armor of God that we can wear and put on so we can fight this fight. And last week, Holly talked about where the battle takes place, the war in our mind, amen? The war that takes place in our mind, and that was just an awesome message because that just nailed it right where it is. And today we're jumping right off of that. We're going to go a little bit deeper, and we're going to start naming names and calling out dark things, and we're going to get some demolishing strongholds today. Would that be all right? All right, for the 40 of you, then that's all right. Today I want to talk to you about something that's been taken care of before you run out into battle. You have to address this situation before you think, come on, not today, Satan, I got my armor on, but if you don't address this, you're a sitting duck. You're a target for the enemy. It's something we don't talk about, church, very much, and we should. Today's title is Demolishing Spiritual Strongholds Over Your Lives. I know some of you are thinking, "Uh uh-oh, um... Is this going to be one of them charismatic throwdowns, getting all crazy in here, getting nervous? Yeah, it's about to get aggressive in the spiritual realm because sometimes you've got to take charge of a serious situation. So God wants to deal with some stuff in here today. And uh, if you are a life coaster and you see a guest here today, I need you to hug on them. Say, Pastor Mike's usually not this aggressive. He's really a nice guy. He's got donuts and coffee afterwards for you. But in my years of ministry, no matter who you are, no matter what background you come from, ethnicity, what financial position, you're rich, you're poor, everyone has stuff they're dealing with. Amen? Don't say amen too loud. Your spouse might go, well, you got all this stuff. No elbow zones, remember? But all of us here, from first timers to pastors, have things rooted in us and against us that the Holy Spirit wants to deal with so we can become all we were called to be in Jesus Christ and all we were called to be for one another in the family of Christ. Today we're going to identify the strongholds within us, where they come from, and most importantly, we're going to listen to Paul and demolish them so we can give God the glory for our lives. Would that be okay? Okay, lock the doors. Nobody can leave. Pray with me. Father, we just thank you that you are the authority over all entities, all spirits, and all men. Father, I'm asking you to throw your weight around in here today. Show the enemy who's boss. Because I know as soon as I said strongholds, people got nervous. We cover up, we hide, we hope you'll just take care of it. Things that some of us have been battling for years that have hindered us, Lord. And Father, I know you're tired of it in your family. You want to have your way. You want to empower us to get freedom today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to look in our Bibles. In the Old Testament, back in Judges, and you have notes. If you don't have any, you can raise your hand or they're out there on the Connect table. Today we're going to look at the divine case study found back in Judges of a good friend named Gideon. 
he's going to show us how God, through a young man, a warrior that everybody thinks is so strong and mighty for God, who was strapped with strongholds, and how those strongholds can hinder a life meant for greatness. They can hinder a family meant for great impact. They can even hinder a community because strongholds don't just affect you. You're not the only one being affected by your stronghold. He permeates out of you and affects everyone around you, even a church family, and we need to take this seriously. So turn to Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Verse 1, it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You know it's not going to go good if you start out with that. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years God gave them into the hands of the Midianites because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and what? Strongholds. Say it again. These people will hold up in the strongholds because of an enemy's oppression. Now, how did they get there? Well, we know they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. But way more was going on. God had just used Joshua to bring the people of God into the promised land to be his people, a people of purpose, and a light to the Gentile. But by chapter 2, that's just chapter 2 out of many chapters, there was a generation of God's people. They enjoyed God's blessing in the promised land. They enjoyed being in faith of God, but they didn't pass down the proper elements of their faith to the next generation. They chose not to pass those things down. When you've experienced the presence and the power of God, and when you don't tell your children and others about the goodness of God, the principles of his his authority and his word, when we don't do that, What we do is we hinder God's hand from moving in the next generations. When we choose to be lazy with sharing our faith in God's hand in our lives, when we choose to say, oh, they'll just get it, they'll just watch us, they'll get it, we are choosing to hinder God's hand in the next generation's life. Can I get an amen, parents? Well, good, no crickets. That's what we need to be doing, lesson number one. And then when that happens, here's what happens in the next generations. We turn to Judges chapter 17, verse 6. It says this, In those days, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, not the Lord's eyes. In other words, they became plumb nitwits. They got goofy. They got off the rails, said, I guess I know what to do. That's when they did evil in the sight of the Lord. What happens when people do what's right in their own eyes? They leave the patterns of the Lord. They create their own patterns, their own mindsets of sin. They create pain. They create wounds in one another. They they create heartaches in those around them. They create heartache in their family. And then that develops into a cycle of patterns, mindsets, and habits that create strongholds. And then those strongholds create more sin, And then that sin creates more strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's a mindset or belief system that has been planted in you by Satan or passed down to you by others that hinders your growth in and full capacity to serve Jesus Christ. Anything that sets itself up from the Holy Spirit growing you in your faith and answering your call to glorify God with your life is a stronghold. It can start with a wound when you're a child, a sin against you, a sin you choose. Bad things happen, all created by sinful behavior that was modeled to you, and then Satan builds a fortress up of lies and doubts that Holly talked about last week. Those things that come against us and stand against Jesus Christ and who he wants for us. See, strongholds keep us from Believing God is everyone, everything he says he is. And strongholds keep us from believing we are everything God says we are in Jesus Christ. And leaves us stuck. And today God wants to demolish something in your life. God's tired of you suffering in a stronghold. He's tired of your family suffering. 
those around you, even your church suffering because of a hidden stronghold and keeping you from moving forward for Jesus Christ and holding his hand back. Turn to Judges 6, 11. Let's look at Gideon. You might remember Gideon as this mighty warrior. This dude crushed 132,000 enemy soldiers with 300 men. Remember that story? What a mighty man of God. Never going to be like Gideon. That's amazing. Lapping water. God gets rid of thousands, gets him down to 300. Great story. What you didn't know is Gideon suffered with strongholds. Gideon was a hot mess. He was a ticket. You would never pick Gideon on your basketball team. Let's look at some of the strongholds he dealt with and how God wants to deal with them. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. That's not Oprah. It's the oak in Ophrah. You've heard of the balm in Gilead, the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiz... Uh, you know this word. It's a Hebrew word. It's actually Abizrite. Okay? Abizrite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midians. Here's your first point for today, if you have your notes. To demolish strongholds, people, you need an encounter or an experience with Jesus. You need an experience with Jesus. We're a people of how-to, self-helps, methods and formulas. Find it on Google. Give me the next step. But there is nothing you can do on your own to break out of a satanic stronghold. you got nothing within you to break out of this on your own. You can't attend church enough. I've been six weeks in a row. Break free of that stronghold. You can't attend enough. You can't attend. You can't read your, you know, your daily devotions enough. You can't serve enough on that team. You can't get more worship songs in your earbuds. It's pure and simple. You need Jesus. You need to encounter Jesus. Look at Gideon. We're going to find out all the stuff he's caught up in, being hindered like the rest of God's people. And here God comes. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down right where Gideon was. Now, this says the angel of the Lord, but in verse 14, the Bible says, the Lord turned to him and said, the Lord turned to him and said, this is none other than the pre-incarnate. If you don't know what that means, it's the pre-baby Jesus at Christmas Jesus. Before he came in flesh, the pre-incarnate Jesus sits right down where Gideon is. Right down under the oak. And here's a great point for you. Gideon's going through stuff, you're going through stuff, and Jesus loves to move in. And Jesus does not let your mess keep him from moving in and engaging with you. That's happening today, right now. You come in, you, many of you come in like, I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not worthy, I don't know if Jesus will. And, and, and he's moving in. He's already talking to a lot of you. Jesus never allows your mess to change how he sees you. He's madly in love with you. He wants to encounter you. He thinks the world of you, and he died for you. You know what our problem is? We think the Lord loves some future version of us. We can just get there. We can just take care of that. One day we'll, and then he'll love us. I don't care what hot mess you're in today. He's sitting right next to you like under the oak of Ophrah saying, here I am. Here I am. I see you. While you were yet sinners, I died for you. When you were yet uh, holed up in a stronghold, I died for you. And here I am, and I'm ready to speak some truth in you. Second point I want to make to you this morning is that to demolish strongholds, you need Jesus to expose them. How many know you're kind of blind? You got blind spots? Any of us got blind spots? Don't leave me hanging here. Yeah, thank you. I don't like feeling alone. The rest of y'all, that's your blind spot. We need Jesus to reveal some stuff. Amen? Come on, Jesus. Show us some stuff. Where's Gideon? Verse 11 says, Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. He was threshing wheat in a wine press. You know how you thresh wheat? Out in the open, throwing it up so the chafe goes this way and the wheat drops on with plenty of harvest. You need a wide open space to get full production. Here's Gideon holed up in this cave in a little wine press. He is not being productive. He's not getting the full fruit out of this harvest. And why? He's afraid. He's got fear. 
Fear has come over him, and he'll never do this. He'll never be that. He'll never reach out. He'll never do what God's calling him to do because of fear. And here comes Jesus to expose it. Fear is a stronghold. It's not just a thought. It's a stronghold over your life. Gideon's cramped up in this hole. He's afraid to reach out because things aren't going to go well. Everything he has is going to be taken away from him. Better to stay here. He's afraid to risk anything because, you know, it's going to come against me. I might die or my family. I might be a bad family leader. He doesn't trust what God's put in him because, you know what, I've seen all around and God don't know about God, so I'm not going to move forward. He is afraid, and so his life in the wine press cave is simple, it's complacent, and it's comfortable, and it's exactly what he can manage. Don't give me no crickets. You know you're in a stronghold if you're using something one way that was created to be used another way. Wheat was supposed to be out in the open. Your life is supposed to be meant in faith in Jesus Christ and do whatever he calls you to do. Not hold up in a wine press. Scared to do anything for Jesus. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to serve on that team. I'm not going to attend that sisterhood Tuesday night, 630 Am I getting too personal? I'm not going to share my faith because it could come back. I could look stupid. I don't know the Bible. I'm not going to love someone because I've been hurt. I'll just get hurt again. I might lose everything if I try this adventure. It's just too uncomfortable, and the fear you have develops a new normal for you of life. And now we're all just normal, and we're all looking pretty good and safe. He didn't die for safe. I don't know if you ever watched that show, Hoarders. You watch that show, Hoarders? Something's wrong with you. You watch that show, Hoarders. <laughs> Holly was watching it once, and I watched show, Hoarders, and I was mortified. You look up this one show. This woman's got 80 cats, 80 cats in an 800-square-foot house, one litter box. Now, how in the world does that become normal? And they knock on her door, and the door just opens, and oh my Lord, the stench, cats everywhere, the smell, and the lady just smiles and goes, hey, like it's all good. It ain't all good. I don't know how she got there, fear of leaving, too much time, just big heart, I don't know, but the stronghold took over, and there are people here living in fear. It's created a paralyzed, non-impactful, almost invisible life for the kingdom. Right where Satan wants you. Fear grips you so you never move in faith. You never risk. Fear of rejection so you don't let others in. So you don't connect. They might find out about some of your strongholds. No, thank you. Keep a distance. You don't join that worship team or any team. Fear of never having enough, so you work a, you're a workaholic or going broke or you won't look like so-and-so, you go into debt. Fear of death, so you never live life. Fear of life itself, so you get depressed and suicidal. Fear, fear, fear. And Jesus is right there. Look what Jesus says to Gideon, verse 12, in all his fear. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. He didn't look like a mighty warrior. Mighty warrior, I am here, Jesus says. How does the Lord see Gideon? How does the Lord see you? The Lord sees you the way he made you. Mighty in him. That word mighty warrior in the Hebrew means a mighty person of value. You don't think you have value when Jesus comes and says, Oh, mighty warrior of value. That's how he sees you. This is why you need an encounter from Jesus. You don't need any other books. You don't need anyone else to say what they see in you. You need Jesus to tell you what he sees in you. Mighty warrior of value. Now look how Gideon responds. You think he'd be like, woo, verse 13. Uh, 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 I added a few of those uhs. Uh, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but. It's going to be his pattern. This is your and my pattern. Pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? 
Where are all those wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us. And give us, come on, you know you sound like that in your prayers sometimes. And given us into the hand of a boss I don't like, of the Midianites. Have you ever said, well, you know, if the Lord is with us, this should have happened to me. Why, Lord, if you're so great? I mean, Gideon hasn't seen God's hand. It hasn't been shown to him. And because of that, he doubts God. God declares, I am here. And Gideon says, I don't believe you. Straight up. The Lord says, I am with you. And you say, I don't believe you. Unbelief is a stronghold. It's one of the worst. If God is with me, why did this happen? If God is good, why is my family a wreck? If God is good, why is my my health so bad? Why do I never get a break? Why does everyone else seem to get the break? If God is a miracle worker, where are my work miracles, God? If God is, if God is, then this wouldn't happen. Oh, God, I don't believe you. And when we get caught up in unbelief, we start to compare our lives with other people's lives, our lack of blessings with those person's blessings, and we start focusing on us, our struggles over God's blessings that he's already given us in Jesus Christ. And what you focus on, you'll get trapped in as a stronghold. Soon enough, soon enough you'll start doubting God, that he even cares about you at all. He must not, because look how blessed they are. He'll never provide for you. He'll never protect you. So you keep your life stuck in the wine press cave. Never venture out in faith. And you know what unbelief does? It hinders God's hand from moving in your life. God cannot move in your unbelief. That's why faith is so important. There are people in this room who won't move forward, thinking God won't really be there. God really won't provide. God doesn't have a plan for my life, not like Pastor Mike's life. So you don't step out. You don't apply for that position. You don't, you know, you don't want to quit that comfortable place and complete that job application, maybe run after that dream. You don't want to start that business because God, because God, you don't join that small group because God won't show up, help you connect with people. You don't share your faith because God's going to leave you hanging and say, oops, gotcha. Unbelief is the tomb of spiritual death. Because you know what Jesus likes to do with tombs? Empty them. Get out of the tomb. Look how good Jesus is. Even in all this, pardon me, but Jesus says this. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength, you say it, you have. And save Israel out of Midian's hand, am I not sending you? Jesus says, it doesn't matter if you've seen my hand lately or not. That's part of the stronghold. You haven't seen it. I've been working, but you've been focused on you. But that doesn't matter. It's time to move. I got a call on your life. Get up out of fear and unbelief and go in the strength, the power that you have. Now, you need to say, I have the power. I was waiting for that. He didn't say, I have the power. Now, listen, this is important. He's given Gideon the power. He's given you and I, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, the resurrection power that we need to get out of a tomb and forge ahead in our calling and make a difference. And God is saying, get up in the power that I've given you. You have it. If you have Jesus, you've got the power. Stop waiting to get the power. Stop trying to go to another worship concert to get this power. Stop envying envying everybody else's power. It's already yours, your power within you, because he lives in you. And with that power comes a calling, people, not a calling to live a complacent life, a calling to get up, go, and save the world with Jesus Christ. I know it seems risky. That's the faith walk. God's got you, I promise. Gideon must be so stoked at this point. You're like, yeah, if I heard two of those things from Jesus, I'd get up and go. I would bust through strongholds. And we come to verse 15. You know what Gideon says? "Uh, Pardon me, Lord. 
but, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Pardon me, but Gideon is stuck. And here he's stuck in a bad self-image. He stinks. And he even thinks his whole family stinks. Threw his whole family under the bus. Guys, insecurity is a stronghold. Bad self-image, shame, your bad perception of yourself develops insecurities. Hey, women, how many men have insecurities in your life? We men are are masters of insecurity. But it's all of us. We all think we're the weakest. We all think our family is the least of the clans. We all think this and we all think that. God knows what his family's done. God knows how inept they are. God knows how far uh, away from the Lord they are. You know your sins. You know your past better than anyone else and all those things you've done. It doesn't say here what Gideon did. For sins, it doesn't have to. We're like Gideon. He probably is just like us, and we can name our own. We all know some of what Gideon has done to face and drive him to say, I'm not worthy. In church, every one of us has endured things we've done. Every one of us have had things done to us, to our families, that are horrific, that are horrendous. Some of us have been abused. Multiple times. Some have been molested. Some of us have been verbally torn apart, made to feel worthless, got into pornography, affairs. Some endured, endured bad decisions from their parents, from others, got them into financial problems, relationship problems, divorce issues, affairs. And some endured, endured just pain and long journeys of walking away from God their whole entire life that lasted for two and three and four generations. Guess what, life coasters? We know we're messed up. Can we be real? You've heard God declare who you are in him many, many times, but you keep saying, pardon me, but you don't know who I really am, Pastor Mike. You don't know who I really am, God. And he says, well, I know you, the one with fear and unbelief and insecurities, and I'm sitting here with you right now in all your limpy, gimpy strongholds. I picked you. I picked you. No, no, you don't know. I picked you. When I heard Jesus say that to me for the first time, I said, you are a bad picker. You must be the worst recruiter this planet. I mean, you've been pick up basketball out in the out in the courtyards, you know, and you come in, you want to pick a team and all the best pick teams, and you know, they pick the guys at six eight and the guy that's got the cool shirt on and he can twist in three sixties, and then there's us, long socks, nerdy glasses. We don't have converse. We got some form of sandal shoe thing, maybe with the toe things. We're just looking as nerdy as all get out. And Jesus comes and says, you, 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 I want you on my team. And we're like, you don't, you don't. Ah, listen, with me in you, you're going to do things you never thought you could do. I mean, I'm talking around the back. I'm talking no look magic passes. I'm talking 360s. And you're like, where did that come from? And your wife's like, I don't know. Jesus in me, you got to stop thinking you're in the corner as a nerd and understand you're a superstar on God's team when he's in you. There's nothing to be insecure about. He loves to mock Satan's team by picking some of the weakest of us and making us strong in him. Because then it's not about us, all about him. Please stop insulting Jesus by calling yourself junk. By saying you're not enough. You're not smart enough. You're not spiritual enough. You don't know enough Bible. He can do all that in you. And there's believers in here saying in their heart, I'm too sinful to be used. I'm too ugly to be liked. I have too much baggage to belong. I don't know the Bible enough. Listen, we got to get over that and move on. God says, I'm here with you, and I don't make junk. His heart is massive, massive for every one of you. You just got to believe it and receive it.
So look how Jesus once again answers Gideon in verse 16. You'd think he'd kind of like slap him upside the head at this point. He says, you know, you're not getting it, Gideon. Poof. That's not Jesus. Perfect representative of the Father. Just keeps loving, keeps speaking truth. He says, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You will do all I've called you to do for the kingdom because I will be with you. God is playing, done playing with strongholds in your life. All of these between fear and unbelief and insecurity and then other ones that you know you can identify with. Bitterness, something done to you, and you've been bitter and sour in your spirit for years. Unforgiveness, you could not possibly forgive the pain that was caused to you. People pleasing, anyone people pleasers in here? Yeah, the ones who raise their hand, you're people pleasers, because I wanted you to raise your hand, and that'd be me. Face that on a weekly basis. I come up here, and a little voice tells me, if you don't preach well enough, they're not coming back. And God says, preach the truth. I'll bring them back. People-pleasing, self-centeredness, pride, control. Any control freaks in here? Come on, give it up. Be transparent. God wants to walk with us into a victorious life. He wants to walk with you into accomplishing all he has for you for his kingdom in this life. But before he does that, he needs to challenge you right here, right today. And here's the third point. To demolish your strongholds, you need to tear them down. You need to tear them down. God wants you to stop and visit some places in your heart some places that have wounded you, kept you hidden for a long time, secretive to a long time. And it's not just younger folks. We got older folks who have been dealing with strongholds for decades. Decades. And God's like, it's time, it's time, it's time. Verse 17. That same night, the Lord said to, G to him, Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd. I don't know why it's not the first bull. I don't know. I'm just telling you, I have questions too. Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this heap. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him, but and you got to listen to this. Because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than the daytime. Some of y'all walking around, I'm bold in the Lord. The fear is just still in him until he tears this down. The people pleaser is still in here until he tears it down. God does not just want you to avoid these strongholds, these hard things in your past. Just keep coming to church, praying, hoping they go away, hoping that God just heals them, takes them away. This is what we do in American church. You come in the door, we get you to pray, we get you into membership, we get you serving, everything's going to be good. And you got this thing, but God will heal it along the way. And then you wake up 20 years later, and you're still full of that stuff. And there's a time he says, stop. Don't move forward. It'll hinder the rest of your life and walk in Jesus Christ. Today, he wants you to expose that scary, that embarrassing, that hurting stronghold in your life so he can help you tear it down. Jesus knows they didn't all originate with you. You don't say, well, that's mama, that's dad. He knows that. But here they are, right in your life, right in your heart. Gideon's daddy, he set up the Baal God. And it was big. If it takes you a bull and ten men to tear something down, how many know that's big? You can see that blocks away. Daddy's got a bail God. Think that was a little embarrassing? It was huge. And Gideon's mama, she set up an Asherah pole in the backyard. Asherah is the queen of fertility, and they would do sex dances around that pole in the backyard. Now, when mama's got a pole in the backyard, it's going to mess a kid up. 
You think you've seen embarrassing things? Gideon's like, Mama, Mama, what are we doing back in the back? Don't go in the backyard. No, you don't want to see Mama back there. Got all our friends. Listen, you got to read the Bible. This is truth. That'll mess you up for life until you tear that thing down. I'm serious. God says it doesn't matter who put them up. Be the warrior to take them down. And God's not going to do it. Take note. He empowered you to do it. Why? Because you need the conscientious decision to demolish the flesh, stomp on it, and move forward in Christ in your own heart, in your own mind. Put the stake in the ground and says, this is who I am. That no longer controls me. I made this decision in Christ to move forward in victory. He needs you to do that. Our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says this, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Say divine power. That means it's not yours. We use weapons with divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every potential that sets itself up against the knowledge of who God is and what he's doing with us, through us, and in this world. And we take captive every thought against us in our own minds that pollutes us, and we make it obedient to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Stop believing this stuff is just going to disappear one day. If you get older, I'll all of a sudden be mature. If you just keep coming to church, keep just hoping for the best. These are war terms. This isn't sitting on the beach. You got to do it. You need to demolish. You need to tear down. Last point. When are we going to get lighter, Pastor Mike? This will be kind of heavy. To demolish strongholds, you need each other. I need you. Paul says, we fight. We demolish. We demolish. We take captive. Gideon took 10 friends. It's a team sport, people. No low rangers. You know what this means? You know what this means Gideon had to do? He actually had to reveal to his pals what's actually going on in him. Yeah, daddy did this, and it's kind of done this to me. Yeah, mama's got the pole, and it's kind of messed me up, kind of created some fear. And Will you forgive me? No, listen, man, it's a team sport. We got some of that too. Let's go. Throw the ball. Make the assist. Slam dunk. Let's do this thing. But to do that, people, you've got to stop being secretive and start revealing the wounds. You have to expose that stronghold. Transparency in the family brings healing power to your life. Strongholds only have power in secret, in the dark. Out in the open, they lose their power. When you're transparent, you realize you're not alone. Hey, we're all in this. We all have them. We can actually laugh. See what Satan's trying to do to me? I see what he's trying to do. Let's laugh at Satan. We all have fear. We all think we suck. Yeah, I said it. We all doubt God, even pastors. If that's so, then let's just laugh, grab a friend, and tear those suckers down and be done with them. Church can be the most secretive place on earth, and it should never be. Because church is a place where Jesus reigns, where Jesus reigns and Jesus loves us, and there should be no, no condemnation in Jesus, no condemnation in here, none whatsoever. We're called to be overcomers together. One last thing. I love what Jesus told Gideon to do. After he and his friends tore down the strongholds, they were to build an altar of worship on top of those things. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. I hope you catch this. It's like God saying, tear down that thing and use it to mock the enemy when you worship Jesus on top of it. You think you had me, Satan? This is how I fight my battles. Woo! This is how I stomp on fear. 
Woo, praise Jesus. I used to fear, used to use money to feed my fear of failure and being broke, but Satan, now I'm using it to be generous for the kingdom of God. That's how I fight my battles. I used to use people to get what I want, make me feel important. Now I invest them in them to show them how Jesus is important and one loves them. I used to take, now I give. My life was a stronghold that bound me in complacency. In complacency. Now I am running hard the race that Jesus has before me. I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I know who holds my tomorrow. Let's go, Jesus. Let's go together. This is worship. It's not always a song. It's stomping on the stronghold and living the life fully for him together with other believers. That's worship. That's how we fight the battles. Now, got real warm in here, but I want to tell you, for those who are willing, freedom is right there. Who in here battles fear? I was afraid to come down to Palm Coast and plant a church because if you left everything behind, I'd just be a failure. Woulda, shoulda, coulda, stayed back there even though it was three feet of snow. Afraid to do what Jesus asked because, I don't know, I'm not that good. How many in here face unbelief? I don't think anyone will show up to church. God's going to leave me hanging said, psych! I don't think that business is going to work because God might not be in it. might leave me hanging. You've got to tear down unbelief and fill it full faith that God is with you. Who are in your battles in security? I'm not sure that anybody likes me most days I wake up. So I've got to work harder, try harder, give more, hoping somebody will like me hoping Jesus will actually love me and say, well done, good and faithful servant, because I know that I'm not enough. You're thinking, Pastor Mike, you know so much Bible. I think I got about this much, many days. And then I pray. I say, I'm tearing that sucker down. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. So I'm willing to move forward. I'm willing to stomp on some things. I'm willing to use the strength, the power that God's given me to stomp on bitterness, no matter how much that hurts, to extend forgiveness and to get rid of unforgiveness, knowing that he's forgiven so much in me. Pride, control, people-pleasing. I will learn in God's power to say no to people when they need to hear no. And say yes when Jesus says go. There are people in here today that have been suffering in a stronghold for years. And if you were honest, you'd say, I don't know, years of attending church just hasn't done it. And Jesus is sitting right with you and says, no, it never will. I've already won the victory. I'm giving you the rope. Now you tear down the stronghold. Now you can walk in that victory. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. If you wonder if God's got you tomorrow, you stand up in faith and say, bring it on. Because he is good, amen. Everyone stand with me. So I'm asking you today, as we close, if you want to experience a breakthrough, and I know not everybody in here is like ready for this, I get it, but if you're ready, if you've seen what strongholds do in your life, what it's kept you from, your family, what it's kept them from, how you've already passed things down to your generations, your kids. If you want a breakthrough, and I don't mean one of these breakthroughs sometimes we're talking about, I'm breakthrough for another job. You need a breakthrough from stronghold. It's only going to come when you decide he's given you the power to step up and tear it down. And if that's you today, I'm challenging you to accept his invitation to step up here. And you write that stronghold or maybe multiple strongholds down on the piece of paper and you stand up here 
and we're going to worship right on top of them as we tear them down together. So you come down. You can start now if you want. Some of you got a long list. I know my list is long. You just write down what your strongholds are. And if you really want to do this right, you share it with somebody next to you. You know, I got that too. Yeah, I got that too. And we're going to worship. And we're going to battle the enemy together. And then we're going to, at the end, we're going to say a prayer together. Together, we will demolish the strongholds. Father, we